Hey y'all, this is Dan with the Hemp Highway of Kentucky with another episode of Hemp Threads, Weaving an Industry. And uh, today we are literally weaving that industry because we are with Bruce Ryan, the Chief Executive Officer of Canna Systems Canada, and they are heavily involved in uh, equipment and building infrastructure for the hemp fiber industry. How are you doing today, Bruce? Dan, thank you very much. Doing great. I um, appreciate the opportunity here. I wanted to uh, be able to talk with everybody and pass along the um, work that we've been doing with system that breaks up the hemp stock. It takes the hemp stock and turns it into fiber and core material. Nice. You know, that's, you know, that's, I think everybody's, Everybody looked at CBD as kind of the foot in the door for the hemp industry, like that was going to get us kind of some ability to get it, you know, programs. But people say uh, the fiber and industrial uses, uses down the line are where the real industry long term lays. So it's, it's awesome. Tell us about the equipment that you set up because that's, I mean, there's a, there's a lack of processing capability, at least in the United States. How are things in Canada? Well, what we did was um, working with a group of hemp farmers, uh, a little small prototype. Uh, oh gosh, that's, that's going back uh, probably two, couple of years now, a little bit over two years. And we decided that uh, the, the small machine was working well enough. It was hand fed, uh, you know, processing small amounts. But this thing would process uh, green stock. It would process uh, stuff that had been dried, baled. So we decided to go ahead and ramp up the engineering on this and build a larger machine that was capable of handling an entire bale because this is something that we were seeing in the, the Canadian hemp farmers. A lot of times, uh, guys that had any stock left over, they'd bale it, but then it would just sit out in the yard. So we wanted to uh, come up with a machine that would work on the farm and would be suitable for your, your smaller hemp farms. And if you needed more, well, buy more machines. So we put this thing together uh, over a period of time, got it working so that it was able to process uh, like a large round or square bale and break it up into the, um, the fiber at one end and the core coming pouring out of the main decorticator heads. We then turned around and we designed this so we could build it into a 40 foot shipping container. You know, thing you see, uh, you know, standard, uh, on standard transport so that we could deliver a machine any place that uh, you can get a, a, a transport. You could bolt it to a trailer if you needed to and move it from farm to farm. Self-contained, self-powered, and like I said, it handles the bale at a time. What it does on the farm is it will pro probably process um, probably up to 1,500 acres would be about the limit on this thing. Well, we have hemp farms here in Canada that, that have 10, uh, let's see, 10,000 acres. I mean, call. even when Kentucky was at its peak in the 1840s, you know, when we led the, the world and the, or the United States and domestic, our farms are always small. It's a family, you know, if somebody had a couple thousand acres, that was a huge farm. So when you uh, talk about that in Canada today, my brain is just... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Canada has a fair, fair bit of uh, farmland. This and is true. <laughs> You know, here in Ontario, I think we grow something like three million acres of corn, but only 3,000 acres of hemp. So we need a machine, like I said, that, that would work, um, like for someone that's gonna buy one of these things, about 200 acres is probably your break-even point. Right. But 
we'd heard from farmers that, um, yeah, guys that have been growing for CBD, they didn't have a lot of property, but they still had stock they needed to deal with. And this is one of the reasons that uh, we set up as a portable machine. So you can drag it around from farm to farm. Um, and it's, it's a diesel power source, you know, because everyone's got diesel on the farm. Right. So what's the, um, you know, one of the, one of the obstacles that's always been to Kentucky's hemp market has been, our, has, has been twofold and it's, they're kind of related. Um, and of course that's a hundred years ago too. One was quality of fiber. Uh, Kentucky fiber tended to be a little bit dirtier and not as strong as imported fiber. And that was related to the way we rotted it. You know, we would do it in the field as opposed to in a stream. Yep. You know, you talked about doing dry stalks. So, you know, tell me a little bit about how we've changed uh, our ability to handle different the, the plant in different ways or the, the stock in different ways. Cause it sounds like you don't have to go through as much of that or am I? Oh no, 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 no redding. In fact, that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to get away from because that, that'll degrade the, the core material quite a bit and it'll discolor the fiber a lot. So we were looking for something that um, could process anything. It's just been cut and dried and baled like hay. Okay. All right. And, you know, if you keep the stuff undercover, you know, we, we, we processed some bales. I think the guy had, had this thing sitting around for five years or so, but they sitting in the shed. So, you know, the, the, the fiber quality didn't degrade over that period of time. It's the stuff that's sitting on the yard that has a, a little bit more of a problem. But uh, part of the other thing we were looking for was to be able to turn out long fiber. Right. This, this is where some of the industrial um, consumers had come up asking for fiber lengths that were two and a half to six inches long. And the existing technology just can't do that. It's physically impossible. The hammer mills will put out um, shorter fiber but the maximum length is two and a half inches. And these guys were looking for um, long fiber for biocomposite panel manufacturing. Okay, so kind of like doing a, a weave type of thing or laying the fibers out long ways. And the longer the fiber, the more um, tensile strength. Well, also like, you know, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think they were orienting the fiber as much as they were laying it down on a mat, but they needed that length so the, the fibers were bonding to each other gotcha. over, over a large, uh, larger area. So there wasn't spaces between them, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, and, and this company was willing to pay $1,100 a ton U.S. for the fiber. And they were looking for a couple thousand tons a year, which means that you'd need um, a couple, out, couple thousand acres worth of production, but also you had to be able to meet the specifications. That little contract is worth $2.2 .2 million. And that's a very small company that was doing a, a little panel project. The largest company that we've heard from wanted 50,000 tons a year. And that would take 50,000 acres probably, but the, the facilities to handle something like that just don't exist in the marketplace. So this is where we're looking at um, solving that chicken and egg scenario. So a farmer can actually take stock material and instead of treating it like waste, generate income from it. And on the other side of it, we want to be able to feed industrial consumers. They'd love to use uh, the, the hemp material, but it has to be available in quantity, on time. Last year, in North America, over 300 million in hemp stock was wasted due to an inability to process the material into its two components, fiber and core herd. We know this because we have talked to over 300 North American farmers, all looking for a solution. There are 1,500 existing hemp farms in Canada, 
and over 21,000 hemp permits were issued in the U.S. this year. We have designed, developed, and built the R2 Hemp Stock Processing System, a self-contained, portable, modular, high-performance farm machine to address this problem. In 2019, rigorous testing began on the R2's helical head design. The results? Spectacular. The addition of straw walkers on the back end of the helical heads allow for the separation into two streams, the fiber and the herd. Digital control controls the entire system. Bale rippers added to the front end of the machine mean that the R2 is capable of processing up to two tons of raw stock per hour. Mounting all of this machinery in one 40-foot container means that the R2 can travel from farm to farm. So where are some, uh, uh, first question being, where are some of the end uses you're seeing this? You mentioned uh, some, some composite materials, but what, what are some of the other uses you're seeing? Because, you know, I mean, I, the, the textile for like consumer textiles, I just think is going to be a while just because of the, the nature of textiles in general. Well, for example, um, right now China grows about a million acres mm -hmm. from what we can tell. And... I got in contact with um, oh, a couple of you know different hemp growers over there. The uh, typical approach um, they have it very very well organized. So, for example, these guys had a seventy thousand acre hemp farm, and right in the middle of this farm sits a, a hammer mill. In a textile facility. So this stuff goes straight from the fields, right through the mill, right into the textiles. And they probably produce the majority of the world's te uh, hemp textile. The company sent me samples, 60 different fabric blends that they do that range from uh, silk to uh, cotton, different kinds of blends, all the way up to the typical heavy duty hemp canvas that you see. And, and this all comes out of their, their textile industry. So it's entirely possible. What we did in North America is we shipped our textile industry to China. Yeah, oh, and that was decades ago. Decades ago. And, you know, as, as a result, you know, here, here's a company that probably they, they probably dominate certain sectors of the market, but produce a wide range of really beautiful fabrics. So this is entirely possible. More on an industrial side, um, a, co a company that I mentioned that was looking for 50,000 tons, and what they're planning on doing is taking um, very short fiber, but using it for filler material, for injection molding. Okay, kind of like what Sunstrand was doing down in Louisville. Yeah, you know, standard in, uh, injection molding, and this is a, a filler material that for them has certain advantages that they're looking for. Yeah, I, I mean, I was in injection molding for 20 years, and you know, you can get all sorts of, it, it, one, it's gonna give you weight reduction. If they can use that, like what Sunstrand was doing was trying to get the hemp fiber pellet the hemp fiber reinforced plastic to replace glass and that would be a huge weight savings which translates directly yeah. to gas mileage exactly right another company was looking for um uh they're, they're doing hempcrete blocks 
company called Just Biofiber out of Alberta. And they've come up with um, a block system that looks like a typical, kind of like the typical 10 inch concrete block. So you can put a building together, standard block construction technique, but they're using hempcrete instead. And this is where um, the R2 machine turns out a really great core product out of the, the, the center mass out of the hemp stock. And this is something that this company would use in large quantities. So, uh, for example, I think they were quoting something like uh, you know, 15 tons to put up a small building. Right. right. So this is going to be an area that uh, putting up a, um, uh, a block factory near your hemp farms, this would feed the construction industry. Same thing with another outfit. Um, what were they doing? Uh, yeah, there's an outfit out of Australia that was doing microcellulose. So you take the core herd and take it down to a micro level. And these guys come up with a, uh, a forming process and they call it Zeoform. Yeah, I've talked to Alf. They got a really cool project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of our, one of our guys was, um, you know, actually down there working with them. And, you know, we think this would be a, a, a perfect opportunity to, you know, bring up a, a Zeo factory in North America. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I talked to him, it was because they had gotten mentioned as the in one of these uh, written by whatever type of publications where it's going to be the next Lego. And my plastics background, I sniffed that and I was like, yeah, I don't think so. When I talked to Alf, he was like, yeah, we'd love to do that. But we're like billions of dollars in research and years and years and years and years away from ever having that. You know, he's like, you want to make some furniture type stuff and some larger pieces that are formed? You know, we could, and I was, I mean, it sounds like an awesome project. I'm glad to hear you're involved with that. Mm -hmm. You know, same with, um, I was chatting with a guy, it's Craig Wilson out of uh, Kentucky. Yeah, uh, hemp boy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I ran across what he was doing and, you know, this is really exciting. Give the guy a phone call and, you can tell he was in the middle of building a factory. You could hear the construction in the background. And we ordered um, some samples from the guy. They showed up. They hit my desk. You know, they're sitting there. Later that day, somebody stole one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I know who it was, you know. But, you know, looking at it, they're like, this is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another one of the uses for the industry that, has some very serious industrial potential. Yes. You know, you hit on something that, and, and you brought it up a couple times as talking about China, um, that it's historically accurate proximity to the farm that if you don't put your processing facilities close to where the hemp's being raised, it becomes a logistical nightmare. And I haven't found any instances where hemp is being current instances last hundred years where hemp is being transported large distances to make a lot of products. No, you know, and that was one of the reasons that, um, you know, we took this approach with, you know, a, a, a unit that's not that big, doesn't require a building to set it up. It doesn't, you know, like it's ready to go when it arrives. And, uh, you know, we designed this thing so it's, you know, turning out the, the core and the fiber in, you know, four foot square bags. Oh, nice. And that's far more efficient. And also the same thing is, it applies that people that want the fiber don't want any core. Right. People that want the core material don't want any fiber. So these things need to ship in different directions. And we were putting it together this way so that uh, we could kind of solve that problem about how many bales will fit on a, on a transport? <laughs> that, that, that doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> quite often we've spent more hauling the stuff than we spent to buy it. Right. When we were doing the processing. And that was even, you know, fairly, fairly close by in the neighborhood. 
Um, so a lot of people that try to, to sell product to uh, Hempwood, and that's like three, four hours from where the farm is, and they just they couldn't make it work from the transportation. It just you know. yeah, no, and and this is something that um, you know again like talking about like a smaller farm, you know what we wanted to be able to do was show up, process all the bales the guys got sitting there, and then you leave. Right. Right. It could almost be a cooperative type of thing where maybe the farmers get together and purchase a unit and then they bring it around to the different farms and help each other process each other's crops and share each other's knowledge. Well, yeah, and that was, that was part of parcel of, um, uh, again, you know, being able to strap this thing to a trailer. Sure, you know, you can go ahead and move it literally farm to farm. You know, all it takes is the, uh, you know, the actual rig to uh, drag it around from place to place. And this, this is uh, extremely common in the industry. You know, the, the whole entire shipping industry is built around these 40 foot containers. And the, uh, the, the shop that we use, they must have 1800 of these things sitting out in the yard because they ship them from China, shows up full of goodies, but it's not worth shipping the thing back. Right. So they, 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 they've been putting these things up. And when we came along and said, well, you know, listen, we want to be able to, uh, you know, chop this thing up, paint it a beautiful green, you know, and turn it into something. These guys are like, wonderful. You know, this hand in hand works really well together, right? It gives them something to do with the um, extra containers. And for us, it fits right into the whole entire transport industry. Yeah, it's, I mean, you don't even have to customize anything to get it to fit. You just, that thing's designed to flip, fit onto a flatbed, whether it's a truck or a train. You know, they make those things yep. that are cars that are yep. designed to, so if somebody was placing an order for like four of them, you just stack them up and put them yep. up. That's really cool. Exactly right. So um, at about it, at the length of, of fiber you're talking about, do you see any use in like maybe uh, boutique mills or something like that? Um, you know, like where people are trying to do more artisan type of things, uh, threads and yarns and stuff like that. So, and the reason I ask is somebody, and they, they actually went under, they were trying to, they bought a facility that had been a breaking plant back in the 40s, and they were going to turn it into a wool, custom wool yarn mill. And I thought, oh, that's kind of uh, a niche that maybe some people in the hemp industry could service, the, the custom type of thing. But is, I don't even know if there's a market for that. We, we, we get um, you know, inquiries from uh, all over, right? And this is something where um, quite often, yeah, following along, uh, We've seen mostly, I'd, I'd say, like uh, three major areas that come up time and time again, right? Now, most of the industry, as far as I can tell, is, is doing kind of more of, like you said, an artesian uh, boutique level. What I'm more focused on is the, the industrial sectors because this, this is where I see the um, large-scale uh, shift needs to happen and the, you know enough farmers are coming into it that now we're starting to see there would be enough material to fee some of these industrial contracts and that is that that is the um, breaking point right there right that's true I mean once you start servicing industrial contracts domestically the adoption rate for the for the industry it becomes something that's viable for other people to get involved in it's a uh, uh, people don't want to invest in a new technology or a new industry until they see that they can do something conversely it can't be done until people have invested so it, it you know you're right once you get that big industrial contract it's a it's a gatekeeper almost yeah and and you know i see this is coming up on the horizon this is one of the reasons that um you know, we bootstrapped this all the way up to the point of, uh, oh, that was a nice idea to 
prototypes to full scale engineering. And actually being able to load one of these things onto a trailer and, and uh, ship it down the road. It's, it's, it's been a long road, but I think it's uh, finally gotten there. Oh, that is so awesome. And what a great place. We've kind of come up on our, our 30 minutes here. But I think we've got some uh, room to go if you'd like to come back uh, another time and follow up. I know you got this. Uh, I think you were going from your prototype to a larger size. Maybe we can, you know, talk about some of the projects you're doing that on a, on a follow up show. Absolutely. And I'd love, be, love to be able to um, show everybody a little video clip of, uh, you know, the, the, the finished machine. So we'll set that up for a future date. I'll uh, get that polished up on the website and I'll send you a link. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Bruce. I really appreciate it. You have a great day. And, and thank you very much. You have a great time. Thanks.